Good afternoon, everyone. You will see that there's actually a, a relationship between, uh, between the uh, two presentations. And this one also could have been done as a, a debate if only uh, I could split into two, but I'll just give both sides. So there are three issues that are related but distinct, which we need to distinguish. The first is what's often called the definition of death or the concept of death. And that, in, a, in, in one way at least, has not changed uh, over the years since antiquity. Death is defined as the end of life or the opposite of life or the termination of life. And then we can talk about the criteria for determining that death has occurred. And that has become a very controversial issue. Uh, and I'm going to talk specifically about two sets of criteria, the older, more traditional cardiovascular uh, criteria, which is permanent cessation of heart and lungs. When that happens, the organism is dead. The newer is the neurological criteria, and that's the permanent cessation of neurological activity, also known as uh, brain death. And then the third thing to be distinguished are the clinical tests to determine if the criteria have been met. And in the olden days, this wasn't terribly difficult. You could put a mirror to someone's nose, see if they would fog up if he's breathing. You could take someone's pulse or listen, listen to a heartbeat. Uh, neurological are more advanced technologically. They include a lot of things, but uh, first might be the absence of pupillary response, but then that would be confirmed by uh, an EEG. Now, there's been a movement from the older, more traditional cardiovascular criteria to neurological. I'm going to talk a little bit about the law in just a moment, but the neurological or brain death is widely accepted as the correct criteria for death in many, many places. And this is for a couple of reasons. One reason is scientific or medical, and that is the idea that brain death is a better indicator that someone has died than cardiovascular criteria. Um, and one reason for this is it's not enough to see that the person has stopped breathing or that the heart has stopped because you can use electric paddles to get restart the heart. You can put someone on a respirator, which can breathe for the person, right? So the mere fact that they've stopped breathing or their heart has stopped does not show that they are dead. By contrast, once the brain is flatlined, there's no way to restart uh, the brain. I don't know if that's just em empirical or in principle, but we can do it now anyway. Well, one question comes up, is brain death, is when someone has been diagnosed as having suffered brain death, is that a more reliable indicator of death than using cardiovascular criteria. And I will just mention, because this was an interesting Hong Kong case, in 2009, Suzanne Chin was a Hong Kong lawyer and a mother of two who one morning suffered a heart attack, was taken to the hospital, went into a coma, and very quickly after that, the doctors told her husband that she had brainstem death and that they should remove her from the um, life support and her husband wasn't having anything to do with that. And three days later, she woke up. She's completely recovered and living in Singapore. <laughs> so we don't really know the story. Was it a miracle? Were the doctors negligent? Who knows? But there is at least this one story. The other reason behind the move from cardiovascular to neurological criteria is organ donation, right? Because if you use the neurological criteria and say that someone is dead 
when the, there's no more brain activity, transplant surgeons can remove the vital organs quickly before they deteriorate and become unusable. And if you don't have that as your legal definition of death, doctors who remove organs, right, uh, could be charged with murder. If you use the cardiovascular, you may waste all of these organs. And also what um, defenders of uh, brain death have said is, look, once the brain dies, everything else, all the other criteria inevitably follow. The heart's going to permanently cease. The lungs are going to permanently cease. So why must we wait wasting the organs and also using life support for people who are never going to come back and cannot benefit from them. So there's kind of a utilitarian argument uh, about organ donation that uh, it comes up in this question of how to determine what death is. So I'm going to give you um, US law and policy, as I am an American. And really, this goes back to 1968 when the Beecher Committee of Harvard Medical School came out with a, a report in which they said, essentially, that patients on life support whose brain function has completely and irreversibly ceased should be declared dead and removed from the respirator. And that was followed by uh, a, the Uniform Determination of uh, Death Act, which was itself based on a report from a very influential presidential commission in 1981. And they agreed with the Harvard uh, Committee. Uh, they also said that it should be the whole brain that dies, not just the brain stem. And that differentiates US law from the law in the UK and Hong Kong, which follows uh, UK law in this. Today, whole brain death is the marker of death. It's the law for determining when someone has died in every state, except New Jersey. And New York is a little, little peculiar, too. But we'll come back to New Jersey when I tell you about a, a recent case. So. Why do the defenders of whole brain death think that it is the right criterion uh, for death? James Burnett is a physician who says it is uh, the best definition for a number of reasons. And the first one is that brain death fits best with our common, ordinary meaning of death. And he has some things to say about what that common, ordinary meaning of death is. First of all, death is a biological concept. Uh, we die as biological organisms. He also thinks that when we talk about the death of a person, that's really kind of a metaphor. What we mean is that the biological organism associated with the person has died. It is not something that is determined by social convention. Applies to organisms, not persons. And also, some people have argued that death is really a process, and that you have uh, a state when someone is clearly alive, and then you have a state when someone is clearly dead, stiff, cold, beginning to uh, deteriorate, right? But then we have a lot of stages in between, and they've argued there's really no one point at which we can say the person is now dead. Uh, it's a process. And Burnett rejects this. He says it is not uh, a process. It's an event. It's markable in time. We declare the moment of death. right? And he also says that it's an all or nothing concept. That is, you can't be a little bit dead. Right? You're either dead or you're alive, and there's no uh, in-between stage. Now, he also s defends whole brain death on the following uh, reasoning. He says the ir irretrievable loss of an organism's emergent functions, and he doesn't really define it, but he gives some examples, such as consciousness, control of circulation, respiration, and temperature control, 
when the organism loses these, that results in the loss of the critical functioning of the organism as a whole and is therefore the death of the organism. And what he's really responding to is people who have said, you know, even after all of these things happen, there's still some electrical activity, so why do you say that the brain is completely dead? And he said, look, we don't have to wait for every single tiny electrical uh, impulse to go. When the loss of the, of the emergent functions, which are responsible for the critical functioning of the organism of the whole, when those are lost, the organism is dead. And since those functions are controlled by the brain, both the brain stem and the neocortex, the death of the whole brain is what results in the organism, and that's why he supports whole brain death. There are some very um, trenchant criticisms of brain death um, in the literature, however. And one is that people who are brain dead don't actually look dead, right? They are, they are often on machines, which in, you can see the chest rise and fall. Their skin is uh, warm and moist. They are not cold and stiff. So to say that they are dead, first of all, doesn't seem to fit our ordinary uh, conception of uh, death. A more um, sophisticated objection comes from Alan Schumann and is also taken up more recently by Robert Trug and um, Frank Miller. And what Schumann says is that the problem with Burnett's view is that he thinks that the brain is the critical system so that when the brain dies, the organism is dead. And Schumann says that's simply not true. Individuals who are brain dead, have been diagnosed as having suffered brain death, exhibit a number of functions of living organisms. If they are continued to be fed artificially, they digest food, they excrete waste, their wounds heal, uh, they undergo sexual maturation, and some brain-dead women have even gestated fetuses and given birth, usually by cesarean section to be sure, but they have given birth. So are they dead? Right? And Schumann has one example of a young boy who lived for 15 years after being declared brain dead. So this notion that inevitably within a matter of hours or days they will be dead, he says, is not the case. It depends on how much support you give them. Brain dead patients also retain essential neurological functions such as the regulated secretion of hypothalamic uh, hormones. So what people like Schumann are saying is, these people may be dying, but they are not dead in a biological sense, because dead people do not sexually mature, their wounds don't heal, and they don't give birth. So that's the argument there. Now this was the case study I said I would tell you about. You may have heard about this um, girl, uh, Jahai McMath who at the age of 13 in Oakland, California, was suffering from sleep apnea and underwent a tonsillectomy to uh, cure that. Uh, she seemed to recover OK, but then she started bleeding. She went into a coma. And from a coma, she was diagnosed as being uh, brain dead. And she was pronounced, in accordance with California law, as legally dead in December 2013. But her family refused to accept that she was uh, dead on really two grounds. First of all, they think she was misdiagnosed. They don't think she's brain dead. They also suspect that the hospital was trying to cover up some kind of negligence. I mean, this was a terrible situation. A 13-year-old girl goes in for a tonsillectomy, and the next thing they know, she's dead. Doesn't help that she's black. I mean, you know, there was lots of stuff going on there. 
But they also reject brain death as the correct criterion of death. And when a, a lot of American uh, bioethicists wrote about this, they said, oh, you know, she's a perfused corpse and her family just doesn't understand what death is. But let me tell you, there's some very respectable people, including Alan Schumann and uh, Robert Trug and Frank Miller, who are going, I, I think they're kind of right. I don't think she is biologically dead. It's not a ridiculous or unreasonable position. It's not like, uh, you know, somebody who doesn't want to vaccinate their kids or, or somebody who wants a laetrile to cure cancer, that there's a real issue here. So in any event, the, the um, uh, compromise with this was that the hospital allowed her to be removed from the hospital in Oakland and moved to a facility in uh, New Jersey, because what New Jersey law says is you can choose your criterion of death. You can either choose neurological or you can choose cardiovascular, whichever is in keeping with your uh, culture and, and religious traditions, uh, because there are some Orthodox Jews who do not accept uh, uh, brain death. They, they want the breath and the blood to stop uh, flowing. And there are some other cultures who uh, also feel the same way. And she is on life support uh, today. So it's the very odd system in, in the United States where we have state law governing so many things, and this is governed by state law. She's alive in New Jersey, but she would be dead if she was moved you know, across the border to, to New York. And that seems like a rather peculiar uh, uh, result, that, that your geographical location can determine whether or not you're actually dead. So this, this case raises some very interesting questions. Uh, is she dead? Or uh, to quote the Wizard of Oz when they say that the witch is, is really most sincerely dead. Is she really most sincerely dead? Is she dead dead? Or is she just dying and as good as dead, right? And I'll talk more about what as good as dead means. Or should we say she's not dead at all, any more than someone in persistent vegetative state or even people who are very, very seriously uh, disabled uh, and um, have uh, serious cognitive deficits. You may remember in the Terry Schiavo case, the disability, parts of the disability community came out, uh, the group called Not Dead Yet, and said she's seriously disabled. She was not pronounced brain dead, she was PVS. But then the line between PVS and brain death becomes one that becomes more difficult to draw. So should we accept the view of uh, those who say that uh, brain death is not biological death, should we give up brain death and revert to cardiovascular uh, criteria? Many people are opposed to this as a matter of policy, and one of the reasons is because of uh, cadaver organ donation. If you said we cannot use brain death, then it would definitely reduce uh, the number of um, uh, cadavers where people have uh, agreed to donate their uh, their organs in the United States. We 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 uh, it's opt in in the United States, and that, by the way, is an interesting argument uh, as well. Maybe we'll get back to that one, and it could be a cost of you know, tens of thousands of lives worldwide. Another reason why people are unwilling to go back is because, well, some people say we just can't go back. The neurological criteria are so entrenched now, both in law and clinically, uh, although that we can't really go back. Although I will say there's as much confusion among medical people about brain death as there is in the general public. Uh, and you will see things in the newspapers that say that somebody was pronounced brain dead and then died a week later. Well, if they're really dead when they're brain dead, they didn't die a week later. And you get doctors and nurses also unclear about whether someone is actually dead or whether brain death is like being sort of dead, kind of dead, on the road to death, or whether it really is dead dead. So. The next question is, well, is there a way that we can acknowledge 
that brain death is not, in fact, biological death, and yet keep the neurological criteria. And that uh, is a proposal that we get from Robert Trug and Frank Miller, uh, who say, look, they're not biologically dead, the brain dead, but they are dying, depending on how much support you give them, and they are as good as dead. So what they suggest in a fairly recent article is that sometimes in law, we have a notion which is not literally true, but it has a legal purpose. And they say, for example, the notion of someone being legally blind. That's defined as corrected visual acuity of 20 over 200. So someone who is legally blind uh, is not literally blind. They can see, but we acknowledge that they are so, their sight is so poor that this has both benefits and restrictions on them. We're not going to give them a driver's license, for example. Uh, and we may also give them special uh, treatment in order to compensate for, for the problems that they have. So for legal purposes, we treat the legally blind as if they were blind. And they say, we could do the same thing with those who are brain dead. We can treat them as if they were biologically dead, even though we know that they're not. Uh, and why should we do this? Well, the brain dead are permanently unconscious. They are never going to wake up except for Suzanne Chin. <laughs> anyway. Um, and moreover, they have lost what is valuable in life, which is conscious experience. They are alive as organisms, but they are not alive as human persons in the way that all of us are alive. And that's the sense in which they are as good as dead, even though they're not literally dead. And sometimes Paul says, if you ask people, would you rather be dead or permanently unconscious, you know, what difference does it make if you're going to be permanently unconscious and you could know that you're never going to wake up? Would it make any difference to you that your organism still, still survived? So Miller and, and Trug, in a number of articles, have, have said, look, it's not that we're saying we should go back to cardiovascular criteria. That ship has sailed. But let's at least be honest about what we're talking about because they are not biologically dead. Jahai McMath is not a perfused corpse. She's as good as dead, but she's not dead dead. Well, there are some problems with saying that they're as good as dead, because what do you do then about people in persistent vegetative states, PBS patients? They're also permanently unconscious. and. To the best of my knowledge, no one has woken up fr from an accurately, that might sound like question begging, an, <laughs> an accurately diagnosed persistent vegetative state. They too have lost what's valuable in life. Now, some people would say, yeah, sure, let's call the PVS also dead. And um, they have offered a radical redefinition of death as not biological at all, but as the absence of personhood, or personhood is a very rough way of explaining this, and it's not exactly Jeff McMahon's view. It is probably Robert Veach's view. But um, Jeff McMahon you know, has this view that uh, what am I essentially? I'm an embodied mind. And uh, before my the organism that uh, ended up as me, namely the fetus, became conscious, it was my empty organism, not me. And if I go into, I, couldn't, I can't go into, but if my organism goes into persistent vegetative state, that's my empty organism at the other end, not me. Right? Well, as I say, this is a radical uh, view. I will just tell you that no legal system anywhere has uh, accepted it. And there is also then a question of a slippery slope here. If we accept that people in PBS are dead, what about anencephalic infants who are born without a forebrain and who will never be conscious? Are they also dead? Some people have suggested yes, and we should be able to take their organs and use them to save the lives of uh, 
a fully functioning brain uh, infants who need hearts, for example. Uh, and then other people have said, well, why draw the line just at anencephalic? Why not very, very severe congenital abnormalities that will result in death? We're not going to be able to keep them alive. And then that raises a question as whether there is a principled way to draw a line. Do we really want to even uh, get into this at all? So there are an awful lot of debates that have come up uh, around this whole issue. And uh, you, it would be interesting if I were better at this to kind of draw a chart because people are sometimes opposed to one another on one issue but not on another. I've talked a lot about those who support cardiovascular criteria. And by the way, Schumann does. He thinks we should go back. He thinks it's a better criterion for death uh, versus those who accept uh, brain death. But even for those who accept that the brain is what is the essential thing, uh, there's uh, uh, debates between those who think it should be whole brain and those who think it should, just should be uh, brain stem, and, uh, and those who think that uh, it's not really the whole brain or the brain stem. What really matters is the neocortex, because that's the part of the brain that's responsible for what makes us really human, namely our ability to think. And, and, and reason and, and relate to people. And then um, there's the question about whether uh, is death really uh, a biological concept or not? And uh, certainly all of these, Burnett, Schumann, Trug, and Miller, they all assume it's biological, but then they disagree with one another about what's the best biological criterion uh, for uh, determining this biological uh, concept. Uh, can neurological criteria uh, be defended? Burnett thinks it can. Schumann, Trugen, Miller thinks it can't. And then there's the question of whether we should bring in the utilitarian uh, considerations. Is it relevant uh, that organ donation depends on using brain death as the criterion uh, of death. Schumann says rather dismissively, utilitarian reasons, you know. <laughs> so like the next thing we're going to start doing is, you know, just killing people so that we can take five of their organs and save other fives, uh, save, save others. And there's also a dis debate about whether it actually would harm uh, organ donation. So there's that whole debate. And then it raises the question that I just mentioned before, which is, well, how do we think about death? Is, is death primarily a biological phenomenon? Most scientists and doctors would assume that it was. But then there's an argument for saying maybe we should look at, at it as a more cultural, religious, or philosophical uh, phenomenon, the way at least some people uh, uh, suggest. And finally, is it an individual decision? And that's, that's the way it is in New Jersey. You, you can choose. Now, within limits, you can't just say, I think I'm dead if I you know, can't do algebra anymore. You're not allowed to do that. But you do get to choose between neurological and cardiovascular. Or should we say, no, we need a uniform standard. Uh, and uh, on that reason, someone might say, it is very peculiar that you can be dead in one state, but you would, you would be alive if you were in uh, a different state. And then there are some further philosophical questions raised by this whole issue, which is why I, as a philosopher, am, am interested uh, in this. Um, because the debate over which criteria are most appropriate for death really is dependent on conceptions of our nature. Uh, it raises the question, what are we essentially? Are we essentially human organisms? If that's the case, then our death should be no different from that of other animals, or at least higher invertebrates. And it doesn't make a difference whether we're talking about a hamster or somebody in this room. The criteria should be the same. Or are we essentially persons or embodied minds, conscious, feeling, thinking uh, beings? That's what Jeff McMahon and Robert Beach and John Lizzo, when he was here, uh, also have argued. On that view, once the capacity for consciousness is permanently lost, then the life of the person 
is at an end. And furthermore, there may be very little reason for keeping the organism going once the person uh, is gone. So thus, the reason why it's so interesting to, I think, to philosophers is that the debate over the definition of death does not merely have uh, social implications for organ donation, does not simply have a uh, policy uh, uh, definition about uh, when we declare death or clinical implications, but also it raises these philosophical questions about personal identity and when an individual human being's life begins and ends. Thank you. the Susan Chin uh, case into a discussion. In fact, the, the, uh, the real saga of Susan Chin did not unfold in 2009 when the case actually took place, but it unfolded in, in, in various interesting ways because uh, according to, in, in fact, I, I read about it in the Richard Dawkins uh, Science for Reason Foundation because there was uh, never a claim made that she was declared uh, um, uh, you know, brain dead. And I think there's a huge amount of religious fundamentalism that accompanied. In fact, her brother, who was a doctor, went and said that, you know, my colleagues in Singapore prayed and we prayed and, and that's how she recovered. Not, not understanding the fact that she actually took uh, a huge amount of support for the, the uh, transfer from Hong Kong to, to Singapore. Then, as a result of this, a lot of um, uh, discussion took place in websites such as against organ donation. And I'm glad you raised the point that a very firm definition of death on a neurological basis uh, has, I mean, we, sh we should forget the utilitarian consequentialist approach, but I think there is a very strong biological reason to, to declare that. And I think that's where the position stands. So apart from that comment, I, I, I want to leave it open to the audience. And maybe you want to wish Thank to comment you. on Thank that. you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Yeah, it came out in the news like in, I think, 2013 or 2014. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. right. Uh, you, 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 you line up the questions. OK. Uh, <laughs> okay. On then, uh, Alistair and then Thank you, Bonnie, for this excellent, fascinating <laughs> lectures on a very interesting topic. Um, I, I'm wondering, <clears throat> I mean, suppose one were to say that uh, in, in a certain case, uh, if we can just say, oh, maybe someone is no longer a person, but you know, the biological organism is still alive, uh, would, would that solve the problem? And, and in saying this, I, let, let me refer to Saul Kripke at one point made uh, an argument many decades ago that uh, he said that the Eiffel Tower isn't identical with the metal uh, it is made of, even though they occupy the same space and time, because if we were to apply heat to it, the metal will melt, and the metal will still be there, but not the Eiffel Tower. So I'm, I'm in saying this, I'm, I'm therefore, you know, if we, we use this argument, uh, I am at this point both a person and also a biological organism. But if one day I get Alzheimer's disease, and at the third stage, the final stage, I, I will be no longer a person, but I will still be a biological organism. So I'm just wondering, uh, you know, is it enough just to, in a certain case, for example, the case of the 13-year-old uh, in Oakland, uh, can we simply say that, well, she is not, I mean, the biological organism is still there, but not the person, or do, do we also need to say, am I essentially a person, or am I essentially a human or animal? Thank you. So, um, the two philosophers who debate this uh, are um, uh, Jeff McMahon and David de Grazia, and Jeff McMahon says, uh, that once I permanently lose consciousness, I'm no longer there, right? It's not me anymore. There's an empty organism. And David de Grazia says, well, wait a minute. If we take that view, then 
if we're not human organisms, we're not animals. And everything that you're taught in biology is just false. He says, how can that be? Of course I'm a, uh, a biological organism. And so David de Grazia would say, when I permanently lose consciousness, I may no longer be a person, but it's still me as the biological organism. And then I say, I don't really like essentialism, so <laughs> I, I'm more with you. I would say I'm a person and a biological organism, and uh, if we look at it in one way, I, you can, I think we feel torn with this. So for example, uh, Terry Schiavo's husband, uh, Michael, uh, said about his wife when she was in a persistent vegetative state, Terry lo left us a long time ago. And that sounds right, that's true. But on the same point, he might say, I, I have to go in to visit Terry, <laughs> you know. Uh, so I, I don't think that we have to make that kind of a decision. But then the question comes, well, what are the implications for law and policy? And one possibility would be to say that, um, and this gets back to organ donation in a way, people could say not just when I am pronounced dead, it's OK to take my organs, but it's also OK to take my organs if I am in persistent vegetative state. Mine would personally say, if I were diagnosed as, as PVS by two board-certified neurologists, I don't want any gerontologist making that call. <laughs> but uh, you, know, you, 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 could, you could do it that way. And I don't think that the individual would be harmed by having. Some people think it seems kind of creepy, you know. But there has been a question of why all of these thousands of people who are being kept alive on life support in persistent vegetative states. To what end? To what purpose? So you might want to say, even though the biological organism is alive, there isn't really any good reason for sustaining the life of the organism if we can know with a sufficient degree of certainty that there isn't going to be any return to conscious. Thank you. Um, uh, a couple of questions I'm allowed to. One, one is about the brain stem versus whole brain criteria and maybe a little bit about the rationale of why, why is there are these different criteria in the different uh, legislative settings. The second question, I'm afraid, is a bit more tricky. Um, if, if the human body uh, itself is not the relevant thing, then as some countries have suggested, why wouldn't higher primates who have language and can communicate on social life be regarded equally as persons as uh, hu people in human bodies? OK, I'll take the easy one first. I thought you might, yeah. If you reject the notion of species as having moral relevance, as uh, Peter Singer and, and Marianne Warren, and even Don Mark, who is a uh, uh, anti-abortion, do, then you have the following problem. If you can't just say, all and only humans count, because you say, Re really? It's humans that matter? Uh, what if we should come across beings on another solar system, and they you know, talked, and they did mathematics, and they had moral reasoning, and all of this, and we go, no, 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 you are not homo sapiens. We can eat you. you know, so that, that seems kind of irrelevant, what species you, you belong to. Uh, and then they also say, why should we think that, species, that all human organisms, what about people in, in PVS? And, that brings up that. But if you say that, then you have the following problem. There are plenty of human beings who have less capacity than not only chimps, but you know, dogs or pigs or, uh, and most adult mammals. So this is a real problem. Either you let everybody in to your moral community, all, all the, the mammals, or you say, no, you have to have uh, high-level abstract thought, and you leave out the uh, cognitively uh, deficient, those with severe cognitive deficits. Or you say, the hell with it, we're going back to human, right? <laughs> when we meet the Martians, we'll worry about it then, but we don't have to worry, worry about it now. The reason I said it was easy is I think that um, 
Uh, I don't think all animals are equal in the way that Peter Singer does. I think that animals, uh, that is, sentient beings who are also persons, have a higher moral standing. But I think that probably we should leave the chimps alone. I mean, they're kind of awfully close to us, and uh, I, I think uh, they should probably, may, may, maybe not entirely equal, uh, they certainly don't have moral responsibility in the way that, uh, that human beings do, but I think we should uh, leave them alone and stop experimenting on them and putting them in zoos. <laughs> so, and the other one about brain, whole brain and brain death, I wish I were better qualified to answer this. I read the, the literature and I really didn't understand it uh, sufficiently. All I can say is those who opt for whole brain say, uh, look, some of these very important functions are taken not just by the brain stem, but by the, 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 the neocortex, so it should be all of that that's dead. But I don't really understand why, uh, why some say, no, let's just have it be uh, the brain stem, and why this difference, and if there's a good argument on either basis. Okay. Um, we're going to hand it over to Dr. S.F. Loy and then to Chan Su. But before, actually, Professor Campbell was looking at me and, uh, when he talked about a brain stem, uh, et cetera. But I, I wish to inform him that amongst the medical fraternity, uh, it is very well recognized that orthopedic surgeons uh, function at a spinal level. So, <laughs> <laughs> But do you know the answer to his question? Uh, okay, I yeah, can help you. Knows, so that's why I'm, I'm putting it to him. <laughs> uh, I'm very pleased I rushed back and joined this lecture as I've been listening to the last two, Monday and Tuesday. Uh, let, let me, uh, perhaps it's fair for me to declare my conflict of interest first, um, so that you know whether I'm calling myself what I'm going to say. Um, SF Lowy from Hong Kong, I just rushed back from a patient's group. I just joined 200 patients on dialysis at home who have been waiting for transplant for the last five years. I was the chairman of Hong Kong Kidney Fund, Foundation and Transplant Society as well. Right, let me join this. The reason I'm here because uh, after my retirement, I find time, and I think I, I need to understand the, the discussion, which is not new. When I come back from UK 20 years ago, I held a Hong Kong forum, discuss what brings them dead. And we had a very good discussion on that. 20 years later on, we're still discussing. I fear that 20 years later, we'll still be, if I'm not dead yet, I'm still be here and we'll still talk about the whole thing. I, I think what we need to clear, I, I, I urge that maybe there'll be another forum where I, I, I really like to, I'd love to hear from new people. I think there should be an occasion when you and also the medical people sit down together and really, really have a really good discussion of what the issue is because we need to understand, we also need to learn from you. Because once you understand the basic biological and medical things, then things are clear, are much clearer. The, let me, uh, sorry, I'm, maybe just now let me take a bit of time because I think it's useful because I'm trying to help everyone. I'm not only helping the patients who, are, who, who is dead or not dead, but also helping a lot of people. Every single patient who died from brings them dead. I might save seven other patients. When it's come to you, you may change your view very quickly. If it's a next of king or your wife or other people in this position, your view of dead or what's dead, you may, may be different. So I'm trying to help everyone. Now let me try, to make, maybe for a sake of everyone, trying to understand the difference between brings them dead and bring dead. We have a lot of debate on that. It's a process of dying. I think we get terribly wrong, messed up in defining, and we're not defining well. We, there's a clear cut difference between brain stem dead, dead here, from brain dead to heart stop. And we cook the whole thing together and merge into vegetative state. There are clear distinctions between that. And they were misdiagnosed that where we've got a problem. I was going to raise my hand up say objection, that Chin's case and the other case is a wrong I, I, honestly, I cannot be sure that one million and one chance that no one got it wrong, but it could be, I, I suspect. So if you don't do the analysis properly, but if done properly, there's absolutely no chance you can to, be, to, be, to recover. Let me very quickly take you through, as I explain on the radio, trying to explain what people, why they need to organ donation. What happened is, is unfortunately, tomorrow, you had a massive bleeding in your head, okay? Or you had a road traffic accident, and you shut your head, and your brain swell. And imagine your brain is inside your skull, it's fixed. If your brain swing swollen, what will happen then? It cannot go anywhere. So it push down. It push down your brain stem, which is in the neck. It have nowhere to go. Therefore, the brain will have no circulation. The brain stem function will stop. 
And what does brainstem do to you? Brainstem is the area which they find you, whether you can exist or not as an individual, alone standing there without any medical people around you. The brain control your breathing. It's your brain stem control your breathing, this thing is here. If this area doesn't work, you cannot breathe on your own. Okay? Once that is that, you can no longer breathe on your own and you will never ever breathe on your own. And that can be diagnosed very precisely by two specialists on two separate occasions under five criteria which we repeat. And under those criteria, I would challenge anyone to come up with any case that has ever been proved is wrong. Once that is that, okay, Category, we can keep you alive because we can use a machine to help you breathe. Just like you jump and fracture your neck, you couldn't breathe. I can keep you alive. And you're not dead, is it? So your brain stem dead by itself does not cause you death because we ventilate you. Because we ventilate you, the oxygen will be okay, your heart will be going. But if you're not in a hospital, you can't breathe on your own, no, brain, no oxygen going to your lungs and your heart will stop, and therefore you will have died elsewhere. Now, even the best technology, best technology, best hospital, doesn't matter if you're in PWH <laughs> or have a medical school, if your brain stop, okay, and swell, eventually all the other hormones function will already go as well. Even the best people who cannot give you a life for a long time. You, yes, you can camp, I can tempt you to keep your life for the next 24 hours until, until you deliver your baby. So I fully agree with you, at that moment of pay, pay time, the patient is not so-called dead, dead, in the sense. But, but the women who have um, gestated fetuses have been kept alive for months. Yeah, but that does not bring them dead. Bring them dead is extremely difficult. I still have to hear. You know, in vegetable state, yes, we can keep it long. No, time. brain death. Yeah. yeah. This is a problem where, where, where people are precisely what, what they mean by brain, stem, uh, brain death. Because if you are, in, in my experience, even if you, the best of care, if your lungs, in the heart hand cope and your lungs hand cope, eventually the, your blood pressure cannot be controlled. The brain swells so much, everything will die. So I think that one of the confusions we, we're defining what is extended brain stem death. At that moment in time, it's not that. The body is still circulating, but it's only artificial ventilator. But what about Schumann's example of the person, the boy who was kept alive for 15 years that, after the, being diagnosed? That's the case. I think we need to get back to the issue and argue. Yeah. Was he brings them to right. I don't know. And I also don't because know that, about Jahan McMath. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's very clearly. That, but I, that may be the reason why they insist on brain stem death well, in the UK. What, what, let me answer a question between brain stem death and that. When your brain stem death is dead, your brain does not, it's not dead yet because the circulation is going there. Eventually, the brain stem death is when circulation no longer able to perfuse a brain. And therefore, your whole brain will also die, just like the rest of the body. So it's a later stage. So if you, everyone want to have that as a brain stem death, what does it mean is that, yes, it will, will take another 24, 40 hours until your blood pressure no longer can circulate, and then we can do a scan for you to see whether any more circulation. So if that keep people more at ease, that might be one of the things to do. But that's only just delay things for 40 hours because the diagnosis is very clear. It's whether you have able, forever, able to breathe on your own. Right. If you're not able to breathe on your own, then at this moment of time, after you've done the second brain stem death, in ICU, we can put that time, that time down as the time of death. So um, the, uh, the, the critics of uh, brain death, like Trug and Miller, say, we're not denying that, you know, if you don't do anything, the person is definitely going to die. But they say that just means he's dying, not that he's dead. And the fact that you shouldn't do something. Some, some of the people have said, well, it would be improper to put that person on life support so we can say he's dead. And they go, no. I mean, that's a separate question. You know, he's not dead yet. Some people have suggested that organ donation should not have the dead donor rule. So just give it up. If you want to be honest about this, say, uh, actually, they're not quite dead yet. But they're as good as dead, and so therefore we should be permitted to take their organs. But they think it's intellectually dishonest to say he's really biologically dead when we could keep him alive longer if we were to put him on, uh, on life support. And I think that argument at least has to be taken seriously and not just 
brushed aside. It's true and fair. After the declaration brings them death, that patient brings them death, and legally that design is death. Yeah. But I'm fully concur with you, biologically, of course he's still a pass, of course he's still pain, of course he's warm. So he's not physically right. totally dead. Right. But it's a dying process. Right. Chan Su. Thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna um, add something. I find this I find this topic very interesting in relation to organ donation. Um, and the dead donor rule is not just complicating things in uh, brain dead donors, but now, um, I think since 2010, um, they reintroduce um, donation after cardiac death in addition to the donation after brain death. So following the very utilitarian spirit, um, they are, it's been that the shortage, so the shortage of organs um, made the WHO and I think Canada and the US, some parts of at least of US, decide that, well, maybe we should not give up either of the death criteria, but have both of them so that we can organs uh, eventually. And the problem with the cardiac death is that it needs to be um, the declaration of death and the organs to be taken doesn't really follow the dead donor rule anymore. So it doesn't, the dead donor problem doesn't only happen with the brain death, but also in the cardiac death. That's, I just want to add that. Yeah, that's, I, I think you're right about that, although it's my understanding, and I'm not a scientist, and I bow to the greater wisdom of the medical and scientific people among us, is that the problem with the cardiac uh, criteria is that if you wait, you know, to make sure, because the question is, would the heart beat on its own if we, you know, tried to start it again. So you have to wait. You can't just say, uh, okay, 15 seconds, gone. Well, wait a minute. Maybe if you had waited five minutes. And the problem is if you wait long enough to be sure that the heart would not start again, it's already starting to deteriorate. So that would be uh, uh, the, the reason for it. But you could use both if you didn't have deterioration. And there's also a debate, as I understand it in the literature, between people who think, eh, it wouldn't really affect organ donation that much if we went back to it. So I don't really know if that's true or not. Bonnie, Dr. Wai. Bonnie, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm Abraham from Hong Kong. Well, with the technology, uh, healthcare technology advances, I mean, things get more and more complicated. Now, uh, for the cases we talk about the uh, brainstem death, we, um, the, the situ usual situation is the patient was intubated, the machine pumping the gas, and then we have the gases exchanged by our lateral lungs we got the drugs infused into the bloodstream so that the heart still beats by itself. Now, with the uh, new technology, we have ECMO, extracorporeal oxygen, membranous, uh, membranous oxygenation. And then, in, in, in fact, that means artificial heart and lung. Now, uh, going back to real life, we have those infectious cases like avian flu or Middle East MERS. And then in those patients, they got difficult to breathe, they put on intubation, and then the artificial heart and lungs. And the patient was put into a slip. And then the patient can't wean off the artificial heart and lungs. So in that case, the patient may be very septic, they got heavily influenced by the bugs or the inflammatory response, but the machines can still keep the circulation, keep the patient oxygenated, when would the patient die? Are you talking about patients who um, are still conscious? Or? Oh, the patient was put under this. Oh, they're, they're put into an artificial coma? Yeah. 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 Well, I think we have to be very clear about that. This is a completely different thing. That patient's not dead, right? Any, any, any definition. They have no, they have not proven that they have totally failed to able to breathe on his own. He could. You cannot say that he could. I think, I think, Everyone has to be very clear about what we're doing. Otherwise, we've got everything together, and then we we'll merge the picture. We're no clear way out. Absolutely. Patient, very few patients afflicted. We are talking about patients who has proven by two well-defined tests that is beyond doubt that you will never ever able to be able to be on your own. And that's only done when you have to ensure that you're not on any drugs, you're not on any sedation. Right, and it's also. Very other, other things that are uh, confusing are uh, very young children who have drowned and might have the mammalian, mammalian reflex, and they may appear to be dead and not really be dead. But as I understand what you were saying about Suzanne Shin, nobody told her husband 
that she was brain dead. Is that what you were saying? That's correct. And, and actually her... Uh, Wouldn't that be in the hospital records? Well, actually part of her MRI, uh, so no, EC, no EEG was done. The part of her MRI transcript is actually on the web. So you can read it. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, so I, I think they have a completely different agenda to, to, to prove that there was a miracle that happened. So um, that, that was the background agenda. So uh, without a doubt, Susan Chin was not, uh, brain, was not declared brain dead. Take it off my slide. <laughs> No, I can give you the links. You can, you can put up all the discussion. The reason why we still having a lot of problems. That's why this morning's report that haven't really understood what brain stem death is all about. Right. How it can be diagnosed. Right. How it must be diagnosed without any margin of error. Right. But I, I wouldn't consider that a miracle. I mean, to me, the miracle would be if somebody, what do we call it when they, the body starts to deteriorate after the person dies? What do we call that? Postmortem changes or? No. What? Not beyond necrosis, when, you know, they start uh, decomposing. Mm -hmm. That would be a miracle if they came back. That would be a real miracle. No, no, I mean someone who's just ordinary dead and they start decomposing and then they sit up. That would be the miracle. Otherwise, anything else? <laughs> No, but I, I agree with uh, SF. I, I think it's a matter of education because if you if you look at if you look at some communities, and and I don't know how many people have have been with uh, uh, dead people for as long as uh, orthopedic surgeons or people from the A and E have, because you can get strange sounds from the dead 48 hours after because there is bowel activity and and the vocal cords. You you can actually people say you know my granddad was talking because you can get sounds. You can get uh, uh, abnormal muscle movements and reflex. It's called the Lazarus reflex. You can get it for 48 hours. Right. And, and then people stick to that saying that, you know, my, I saw my dad move. I prayed and I saw him move. So he's alive. Bring him back. And, and so it's actually, um, the, the, there are cultural, religious underpinnings that require, uh, you know, very serious education. And they also require, and, and here's where, I mean, I, I totally agree with SF that you have to be very, very precise and and once you are very precise, you have to stick with it. And that's where, you know, if you say uh, maybe he's a little bit between brainstem and brain dead, uh, this kind of, um, you know, even a casual remark like this may have influence in Susan Chin's case because her brother was a doctor and, and they have many doctors in the family to, to believe that um, she was told to be brainstem dead and, and then that she recovered was uh, you know, enough to justify that it was well, a miracle. I don't know enough about brainstem death, but um, I, 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 what I've read is that someone like Jahai McMath has undergone sexual maturation. So it does seem to me as a lay person to find it hard to believe that someone whose wounds are healing, who can digest food, who can excrete food, and who can undergo sexual maturation and now have menstrual periods is dead, biologically. I need to read a bit more about that case because I'm not aware anywhere that anyone who's brain stand dead. Any, if I know, I would like to know because if you give myself the situation, then we Well, they claim that she is brain dead, not in persistent vegetative state. So. Well, this is precisely what I'm saying. He might be brain dead, but he's not brain stand dead. It's a, yeah. it's a very, very but whole brain death is supposed to have both brain stem no, and whole. No, no, no. Brain stem death, brain death is not your brain stem death. That's why it's so confusing for the doctor for all the email. So they, they are the, the re... Your brain may be dead, but your brain stem is uh, To whoso. I mean, there are very defined reflexes that define brain stem death, and they cannot, they cannot exist uh, without a functioning brain stem, so that's it. Bonnie, thank you for your talk. I, a little bit of a cultural aspect again from South Korea. In terms of, I, I'm not quite sure about whether there is really the only definition of brain that will help the organ donation unless the family agreed to donate the, the organs. There are huge resistance of the organ donation among the families in East Asian culture because you know you want to preserve the full body when they fail to their uh, you know, parents. So um, it's actually going on in South Korea. When they give a cons informed consent for the organ donation for the any operation to you know the body, the family asked the, the doctor put the anesthesia. 
So even their, their brain dead, their even brain dead, the family will say, I don't want to give up more pain. <laughs> so, so the doctor say, yes, I will put the another surgery with anesthesia. The, the, the father will not have any pain during the pro or procedure. So I thought it was kind of interesting to see that, you know, even after that, until they really kind of have a death, death after funeral, they will still see the kind of uh, live person because we don't really kind of have a funeral put in the, the grave. So they, even that time, they, they feel pain. So, you know, that's like. So the doctors just lie? No, doctors oh. should. I do know that after my mother died and she wanted to be cremated, and there was some problem about releasing the body from the morgue, that my father, who is very educated and smart, said to me, thinking of her in the morgue, she'll be so cold. You know, I mean, she was dead. But I think it's very hard for the living to let go of the feeling that the person is still there, still feeling things. Leo. Thanks, Bonnie, for the lecture. Uh, at the end of the lecture, you mentioned that this discussion would be also influencing about the beginning of life. So I'm wondering if we are considering the logical function as the as a, uh, evidence of life or opposition of death, and how about the, when, when fetus come into being, uh, do we consider that there is evidence that there is neurological function, uh, then there is life, or how, how, would, uh, how yeah. is that discussion going on? Baruch Brody proposed that a number of years ago. He said, if brain death is the end of life, the end of the life of a human being, why don't we say that the fetus becomes alive when there are brain waves at about eight weeks ge uh, gestation. Personally, I think that's the wrong way to look at it because for me, the question, particularly of abortion, is not a question of whether the fetus is alive. The fetus, in my op opinion, is alive biologically. The embryo is alive biologically, but so are gametes and sperm even swim, right? So the question for me is not, is it alive, but is it one of us? And there, you could take the view, depending on whether you think that we are essentially biological organisms, then you can say that human life begins when the organism begins. Is it at conception? Is it later at implantation, when twinning is no longer possible? You could take those views. Or you could take more of a Jeff McMahon view, which is to say, that, that's my organism, that's not me. I came into existence when my organism became conscious. I go out of existence when my organism is permanently unconscious. And I, I, I have argued in my, my book, Life Before Birth, that the fetus becomes one of us in a gradualist sort of way, but when it becomes uh, sentient, when it has the capacity to, uh, to, to, to feel pain. That has other implications for, I think the problem of abortion is multifactorial. So I don't think that abortion should be banned at that stage, but that's based on other reasons. But some people have suggested the neurological uh, criteria. And then the question is, why brain waves as opposed to consciousness? Why not say that it's consciousness as opposed to just brain waves? Any other questions? Yes. How about the physical uh, the insurance people? How do you feel about that? You know, if the, the death definition just not the brain death, they can't accept that is the death, the real death. So that means it will affect the last payment. I don't think so, because yeah. the insurance, they only pay out on the death certificate. <laughs> <laughs> But there's another point which is kind of related to yours. Some people have claimed that there is a financial motive on the part of Jahan McMath's family, that if there is a, a suit against the doctors at uh, Oakland Children's Hospital for negligence, uh, it's capped in California law to something like $2,500 if she's dead. But if she's alive, it's very, very different. Because if she's alive, then is so they, there has been some suggestion, at least in the, in the media, that that is more of a, that, that that's playing a role in why they are trying to uh, uh, keep her on life support. That's the same argument. If you shoot someone in the head, and that, that poor chap is being kept alive on a ventilator, right. you can claim I did not kill that patient. So only once you take the patient off on a ventilator, that's the death. You right. Can argue. 
That's right. And in the beginning of um, uh, life support, uh, some lawyers uh, argued, well, my client didn't kill him. It was you doctors who took him off life support. Uh, but the court said, eh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I think you did it. <laughs> Your client did it. <laughs> OK, just uh, we, we have a couple of minutes left. I, I just want to uh, throw in a little bit uh, of, of controversy here. Um, you know, my background is microvascular surgery. Um, many years ago, I, I had witnessed um, the transplantation of, of uh, um, mouse head onto another, so that you have a, a double-headed mouse. And um, perhaps many of you are aware of the, this um, Italian neurosurgeon who's, who's, who's been invited on TED and who's, who's talked about the head brain, transplantation, head transplant, not yeah. brain, he's talked about the head transplantation. What are your views on that with, with uh, I actually with wrote a blog about that. <laughs> Let me try to remember what I said. I think the first thing I said is, eh, I don't really think so. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen. But um, whether it would benefit anyone to have uh, his head transplanted onto someone else's body, I think, uh, would, would depend, I think, on, he said he could connect everything up so that you would have all of the thoughts and the memories, et cetera. And I think you would have to have a considerable amount of that, because it would do you no good, for example, if uh, the, the brain just died and, and you had somebody else's uh, thoughts, or even, it seems to me, if you went back to the stage of being like a fetus or a newborn infant, uh, I mean, it's why I don't really understand why people are reassured by the possibility of reincarnation. If, I mean, I wouldn't be there, right? I mean, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't remember, so why is that good for me? And I think that would be part of the problem. Now, if they could get it all hooked up well, which I don't think they're going to do, but if they could do that, then it, it might be. But it seems to me kind of a, maybe a misuse of medical Right, and I'm going to throw the ball in, <laughs> throw the ball in Jansu's court, because oh, is the body buying the brain or the brain buying the body? <laughs> anyway, uh, first of all, I want to. Um, uh, thank you all for being very patient, and I, I, I wanted to tell you that at the end of orthopedic lectures, I want to declare the medical student's brain dead, but after this, <laughs> I am actually feeling so alive, and I hope you too are well. So let's, let's uh, give Bonnie a round of applause and thank her for a very powerful Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.